and every life matters. And I call on Claire Hockey to speak to and move the motion. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It is of particular importance to me personally that my first debate as Minister for Mental Health is on the subject of suicide prevention. This is a subject I have spoken about on many occasions in this chamber. And as I have said previously, suicide has touched my life. It is a bereavement like no other, and its effect on those who have lost loved ones is difficult to quantify. So for this reason, I want to take the opportunity of this debate during Suicide Prevention Awareness Week to signal a step change in suicide prevention in Scotland. Every life matters. No death by suicide should be regarded as either acceptable or inevitable in Scotland. This is the radical conviction that underpins the Scottish Government's new Suicide Prevention Action Plan, which we published last month. Every life does matter. And our vision, shared by our partners in mental health and suicide prevention, is of a Scotland where suicide is preventable, where help and support is available to anyone contemplating suicide and to those who have lost a loved one to suicide. Suicide prevention is everyone's business. In the past decade, Scotland has made real progress in addressing this hugely important issue. Between 2002 and 2006, and 2013 and 2017, the rate of death by suicide in Scotland fell by 20%. That reduction is testament to the dedication, expertise and hard work of all of those who work to prevent suicides in our society. And this includes the NHS, social services, the third sector, Police Scotland and of course many individuals, community groups and businesses. It emerged loud and clear that through our engagement process to develop this action plan, through the opposition debate on suicide, through feedback from the Health and Sport Committee, from our wide range of stakeholders and above all from the voices of those directly affected by suicide, that as a country we have so much more to do to support people at risk of suicide and so help prevent avoidable deaths. Every life matters. Our new action plan set out, sets out the Scottish Government's key strategic aims that we want to achieve working with our partners across a range of sectors. It lists the actions which leaders at national, regional and local level must take to transform society's response and attitudes towards suicide. Crucially, those actions extend beyond health and social care. The approach we set out is a cross-government one, which recognises the need for further collective action to prevent deaths by suicide. The plan has been developed with partners, stakeholders and people who have been directly affected by suicide and I'm very grateful to all those who took the time to attend various meetings with me and my predecessor Maureen Watt, as well as the delegates who attended a series of public engagement events held earlier this year. The views expressed and the experiences which people shared have played a hugely important part in informing and shaping the content of the action plan. And I'm also very grateful to the Convention of Scottish Local Authorities, COSLA, for working closely with us in the development of the action plan. And I look forward to continued collaboration with COSLA on this work. I'm grateful too to the members of this parliament, including the members of the Health and Sport Committee, whose carefully considered thoughts and contributions have been of great value in helping us to refine the final version of the Suicide Prevention Action Plan. The scope of the new action plan reflects our shared determination to bring about a step change in suicide prevention in Scotland. Our vision is supported by key strategic aims of a Scotland where people at risk of suicide feel able to ask for help and have access to skilled staff and well-coordinated support. People affected by suicide are not alone. Suicide is no longer stigmatised and we provide better support to those bereaved by suicide and through learning and improvement we minimise the risk of suicide by delivering better services and building stronger and more connected communities. This will be evidenced by our target to further reduce suicides by 20% by 2020 from a 2017 baseline. In 2013, the World Health Organisation adopted a global target for a 10% reduction by 2020. By setting a 20% target, we commit to even greater ambition and a faster pace. This target is not to be seen as an end point, but a marker on our journey of progress towards further reductions in suicide. The vision I have outlined includes particular emphasis on ensuring not only that people at risk of suicide feel able to ask for help 
and have access to skilled and well-coordinated support, but that we provide better support to people who have been bereaved by suicide. I want to highlight these aspects because when someone dies by suicide, this has a massive and long-lasting impact on families, friends and communities who are left behind. It is therefore so important that our action plan sets out a range of actions designed to continue that strong long-term trend in the uh, reduction in the suicide rate in Scotland. For example, around developing refreshed mental health and suicide prevention training, developing a coordinated approach to maximising the impact of public awareness campaigns, ensuring that timely and effective support is available across Scotland for those affected by suicide, and improving use of data, evidence and guidance on suicide prevention to maximise impact and reviewing all deaths by suicide so we can learn from these tragedies and use that learning to help us prevent further deaths. Yes, I've taken an intervention, Mr McArthur. Liam McArthur. I, I thank the Minister very much. Obviously, this is an issue that affects all parts of the country and all communities, but you'd perhaps accept that in smaller, more rural communities, the impact of a, of a suicide can be particularly profound. The, the access to the training she's talking about in, in supporting those um, who are working in this field has sometimes been problematic for those in my own Orkney constituency. Would she agree to, to look at the availability of programmes like ASSIST and make sure that they are available uh, to the third sector who play such a vital role in this area? Minister. I thank Mr McArthur for that intervention. Certainly, uh, I'll move on to speaking about some of the training that, that is part of the, the action plan, but I, I, I fully uh, acknowledge what he says there about impacts on, on rural communities, but it does impact on, on any community. I'm working with my colleague, the Minister for Parliamentary Business and Veterans, about support for veterans, and I am clear that our action plan includes everyone. Everyone does, it deserves the support and care that they need at the time that they need it. That is our vision. The Scottish Government is committed to ensuring that everyone, including all armed forces personnel serving and veterans living in Scotland, is able to access the highest possible standard of safe, effective and person-centred healthcare. We know that there are some population groups where there is an elevated suicide risk. And that is why our action plan includes a commitment to identify and facilitate targeted preventative actions to address that risk. To ensure effective outcomes, it is essential that this work is underpinned by the latest evidence so that we target resources appropriately. The step change we want to achieve requires us to be more focused and to work at pace. And I call on leaders at national, regional and local level to be proactive in creating a culture that ensures that learning is taken from every death by suicide in order to prevent further suicides. Collaborative leadership is at the heart of our approach. To help facilitate this and to drive improvement, we are establishing a National Suicide Prevention Leadership Group. The group will ensure progress on the action plan and will make recommendations on supporting the creation and delivery of local suicide prevention action plans. Members of the leadership group will be drawn from across the third sector, the public and private sectors, and from people with lived experience. The group will reflect a collaborative, inclusive approach to leading the changes that we need. And I'm delighted to see... Alec Cole Hamilton. I'm very grateful to the Minister for taking my intervention. I also welcome the introduction of this leadership group. One of the issues that concerns not just myself but stakeholders outside of here is legacy and what comes next. There was an anxiety that there was 16 months between the expiry of the last strategy and this plan. Will this leadership uh, group have oversight over what comes next when this plan runs its course? Minister. It, I thank Mr Cole Hamilton for his intervention. If he lets me progress a little bit further, perhaps I'll explain a little bit more about what the leadership group will do. I'm delighted to say that Rose Fitzpatrick, former Deputy Chief Constable at Police Scotland, has agreed to chair the group. Rose has considerable experience at senior level of delivering success, and she's my complete support in this new role, and I look forward to working closely with her to realise our vision. We announced in June that we are providing an additional £3 million over 2018 to 2021 to support our increased ambition on reducing the rate of suicide in Scotland. This additional funding is intended to enable service development, particularly in the areas of implementing learning from each suicide and in improving support for those bereaved. Earlier this week, I took part in a Conversation Cafe, which is an initiative by Railway Mission in partnership with ScotRail, Network Rail, British Transport Police, Breathing Space and the Samaritans. 
The Conversation Cafe is an informal means by which staff of these organisations can engage with passengers and share information regarding the promotion of good mental health and provide contact details for services available to support people experiencing mental health problems. On my journey through Fife, it was evidence that people, evident that people thought starting a conversation about mental health could be difficult, but not one person I spoke to didn't think it wasn't important. Presiding officer, there have been three amendments tabled to my motion for this debate. Regarding the queries raised by, in the amendment by Annie Wells, the National Suicide Prevention Leadership Group is accountable to me as Minister for Mental Health and to COSLA on the issues within the competence of local authorities. In December 2018, we will publish the Leadership Group's work plan and there will be an annual report published from September 2019. The Leadership Group will make recommendations to me and to COSLA on appropriate prioritisation of actions and related funding. I acknowledge the points made in the amendments by both Alex Cole Hamilton and Mary Fee, and I'm happy to accept these as tabled. I'm confident that by working together across sectors and organisations and society, we can better identify and support people in distress, strengthen communities and save lives. Presiding officer, I look forward to working with partners over the coming months and years to implement the step change in suicide prevention that challenges the status quo and that ensures that we continue the strong long-term downward trend in suicide in Scotland. We are ambitious for change because every life matters and I move the motion in my name. Thank you, Thank you very much. And before I call Annie Wells, can I remind members who wish to speak in the debate, it's helpful if you press your request to speak button, otherwise you're not going to get called. I now call on Annie, Annie Wells to speak to and move Amendment 13847.1. Ms Wells, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I would just like to welcome Claire Hockey to the, our new role as Minister. And I look forward to working together over the coming months and years on what is a very important topic. We owe it to, to those who have lost their lives to this, in this tragic way to be united in the chamber today, making sure that Scotland's suicide prevention plan is the best that it can be. There are, of course, serious issues within Scotland's mental health services, particularly when it comes to waiting times. That will undoubtedly affect those who, who are wait, unable to receive support at a critical time. That is not, however, to take away from my support to the suicide prevention plan itself which despite serious concerns when initially published in its draft form, has now been welcomed by the third sector organisations. As my amendment alludes to, I want to focus today on the need for clarity when it comes to the finer details. Scotland has been without a suicide prevention strategy for a long time, over a year and a half. So I want to ensure that this plan truly delivers the radical change that the Minister is saying. When in 2016, it was revealed that the suicide rate in Scotland had risen by 8% in just one year, we were united in voicing our concern. While suicide is a complex issue and one that can be difficult to fully understand, the death of 728 people in just one year was heartbreaking to hear. Though we fortunately saw the number of suicides in Scotland reduced last year, it's worrying that Scotland still has the highest suicide rate in Britain and that the male rate of suicide is continuing to rise. As has been said in this chamber before, one death by suicide will always be one too many. I wholeheartedly welcome the Scottish Government's target to reduce suicide by 20% by 2020, but the success of this, of course, will depend on how effectively the plan is implemented. My concerns are not over the measures set out in the plan. In fact, prior to the strategy's publication, the Scottish Conservative backed calls for increased support for families, more training for key staff, and the creation of a new national suicide prevention body. My concern lies in its delivery. And upon seeing the new strategy, I submitted many written parliamentary questions to try and obtain more detail. And the majority of the actions in the strategy have been tasked to, the, the, and to be delivered by the new National Suicide Prevention Leadership Group. I mean, I asked the Scottish Government if the £1 million annual investment in suicide prevention would be used to fund existing suicide programmes. I was told that the leadership group would make recommendations on the most appropriate use. And when I asked the Scottish Government to provide more information on which NHS staff will be given suicide prevention training and what date they would receive it by, I was told that details would be considered by the leadership group. 
And when I asked the Scottish Government to what extent the leadership group will direct its spending of the £1 million investment, I was again told that the leadership group would make recommendations to ministers on the most appropriate use. And what I took from the ambiguity of the answers was that there is still much to be decided in terms of detail. The existence of the group in itself is a very positive step, but there are still questions to be asked. How empowered will the group be to make decisions independently and who will and will be held ultimately accountable as progress is measured? How quickly can we expect the group to report? And I welcome the comments that the ministers made that the first it will be done by it will be set up in December of this year. Um, and again, we still need to know when they'll report to the committee, uh, the parliament. And if the majority of decisions are to be made by the group, can I ask what? Yes, absolutely. Minister. Thank you. Um, the, just just for, cl for clarity, the, uh, there's a, a, an additional two million pound, uh, three million pounds in terms of suicide prevention um, monies going, uh, going into the, the leadership group to assist them with their work. Um, they will, there will be a work plan published by them by December this year, and they will, there will be an annual report to Parliament each year. Um, so there, there, will be, there will be regular updates coming to Parliament about the work that they're doing. Annie Wells. I thank the Minister for that intervention. And I'm just coming on to the, the £3 million additional investment as well. Um, so no, although our national expectations were that the £3 million investment would be allocated to new initiatives at a local level, it is unclear in the answer to a different question whether or not whether all or not of the provisions in the ac action plan will need to be funded by this investment. As raised by the Samaritan Scotland, the cost of training alone will no doubt be substantial. And this is just one action. No, I want to make progress, thank you. This is, this is answers to questions that I have put into the Scottish Government and, and the answers that I have received. Um, I'd also like to receive confirmation from the Minister that suicide prevention training does not become lost among mental health training more generally. As a point raised by Sam H, it's vital that any new training, whether this be in schools and hospitals, includes provision of skills to actively intervene when someone is experiencing thoughts of suicide. And given the success of ASSIST programme, which provides applicants with these skills and has shown to significantly improve outcomes for people receiving an intervention, it's vital that suicide prevention training remains distinct. And can I ask the Minister if this will be the case? And of course, suicide prevention is more than just about policy. It's also about raising public awareness and looking at what we can do as individuals. On Monday, we saw World Suicide Prevention Day, and it was very welcome to see the whole host of posts being shared far and wide on social media, spreading the message about it being OK to talk. In the last year, we've seen male suicide being raised as a major plot line in soaps. And we've seen the ongoing tireless work of charities who provide invaluable support to those who have lost loved ones and those who require their ex expert support when they are feeling they're most vulnerable. We must continue to ensure that they have the resources to carry out their remarkable work. Unfortunately, given time constraints, I'm not able to give all the credit deserved, but I want to put on record my thanks to all those who helped shape the government's new suicide, pre suicide prevention plan which I hope will become known as a pivotal moment helping tackle suicide rates in Scotland. And to finish the day, I would like again to reiterate my call for suicide strategy to be implemented and delivered quickly and effectively with no further delays. With suicide remaining a main cause of avoidable death in Scotland and all the more heartbreaking for the families affected, it should be a priority for any government. We need to remember that at the end of the day, these are real people that need and deserve this government to do the right thing. I move the amendment in my name. Thank you very much. I now call on Mary Fee to speak to move amendment 13847.3. Ms Fee, please. Thank you, presiding officer. Scottish Labour welcomes the opportunity to debate suicide prevention today, following on from World Suicide Prevention Day on Monday, the 10th of September. And can I begin by thanking every organisation, every family and every individual that has helped to contribute to the development of the Suicide Prevention Action Plan. Behind every statistic on suicide is a loved one, a family and a community that faces the sad reality that a suicide was not prevented. 
All suicides are preventable, preventable in some way, and those who have died from suicide did not need to suffer in silence or suffer alone. Every level of government, every public service and every community has a role to play in reaching out and supporting those who feel that they have no option but suicide. The new action plan, Every Life Matters, is welcome. The title is as important as the 10 actions that it contains. And today we must send a message to families affected by suicide that we will endeavour to prevent their suffering happening to others because every life matters. And it is disheartening that the most recent CAMS statistics reveal a record low performance on waiting times for children and young people accessing mental health services. Our amendment today places the necessary focus on CAMS in preventing suicide and calls on the Scottish Government to apply any lessons drawn from the Tayside inquiry to the whole of Scotland where that is appropriate. And, presiding officer, it is regrettable that in 2017 there were 680 deaths by suicide. It is equally regrettable that this represents a rate of 13.9 deaths per 100,000 people, the highest rate in the UK. And all of us in the chamber today will share my concern at the increase in suicide amongst young men, with 2017 showing an increase for the third consecutive year. And we do welcome the 20% reduction target by 2020 in the plan. But a key to achieving this will be the funding. And whilst we welcome the, the one, pound, one million pounds of funding that's been allocated, we need to ensure that funding is carefully monitored to ensure both transparency around that funding and to ensure that the resource allocations are enough to match the aspirations contained in this plan. No single government, no single party or no single individual can be attributed blame for this tragic rate of suicide. As a society, as a parliament, we all shoulder that responsibility. And what is required from all levels of government, all public bodies and third sector organisations, is a collaboration of action to reduce and to prevent suicide. That is what we hope the Scottish Government's new Suicide Prevention Action Plan will achieve. And we will support the government in its aims and in its visions. However, this plan should have been introduced sooner. Ensuring that people at risk of suicide are supported comes with funding pressures. The new mental health investment announced last week only goes so far. Scotland needs a radical reprioritisation of how we place mental health on an equal footing with physical health. And this can only be achieved with effective and adequate levels of funding. The staff working in our NHS, our social care and our third sector are dependent on the right funding to safeguard and extend the levels of care they provide to those seeking mental health support. Many people would suffer from poorer mental health if not for the staff, and I pay tribute to the professionalism and dedication of all those staff working in mental health services. Suicide is preventable, and early intervention is a key to that. That's why it's crucial that we have mental health services for children and young people that support and enable good mental health at the earliest age. With estimates telling us that one in four people have poor mental health, there will be many cases where an adult experiences poor mental health at a later age and may not have required access to CAMS. The reasons for poor mental health range from person to person, but the statistics tell us adults dying are mostly men and many are in poverty. And in times of austerity-driven public policy, it has remained harder to ensure that funding is available. And that's why we must end austerity. We must invest in health and other public services that help to identify, to reach out and support people at risk of suicide. 
Austerity is at the heart of the shameful welfare changes that have resulted in premature deaths across the UK and in suicide. And poverty is a key driver behind suicide. That can be witnessed in the statistics showing areas of high deprivation experience higher rates of suicide. It's worth reminding ourselves that Scotland was once a leader in suicide prevention. However, local prevention work varied greatly with a need for better evaluation and better accountability. This plan is an opportunity for that focus and direction to be placed back to prevention. And, presiding officer, in conclusion, it's our sincere hope that the Scottish Government's action plan continues to lower suicide rates. And for every suicide prevented, we know that plan is working. Investment in CAMS and all mental health staff can play a key part in that. And by supporting Scottish Labour's amendment today, we will show that the Parliament can unite to show every suicide is preventable. Presiding officer, I move the amendment in my name. Thank you very much. I call on Alec Cole Hamilton to speak to and move amendment 13847.2. Mr. Cole Hamilton, a strict six minutes, please. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. It gives me great pr uh, pride to uh, open for the Liberal Democrats this afternoon. And as such, I move the amendment in my name. I just want to take a moment to welcome Claire Hawhey to the ministerial office that she now holds. Claire and I came to this parliament at the same time and we served on the health committee together. And I was always struck by the expertise that she brought from her experience as a community psychiatric nurse. And I welcome her and I wish her every good luck going forward. And so it was that on the morning that this uh, new suicide action plan was published. I surprised Gary Robertson on Good Morning Scotland by telling him that I welcomed it wholeheartedly and I was delighted to see it. I think he was expecting more fisticuffs from me on that basis. But frankly, I'd been calling. There hadn't been a month gone by where I hadn't called for this strategy to be forthcoming because we had waited a total of 16 months since the expiry of the last one. All told, 1,000 of our fellow Scots will have died in that intervening period. I ascribe no blame in that, but it is really good to see this strategy finally in place and see the level of support it has garnered from the rest of the sector, a, a far cry from the initial reaction to the original draft. So I am grateful for that as well. Like most people in this chamber, presiding officer, I have a visceral connection personally to this issue. At a constituency level where this is a human tragedy which is visited on the North Shore of my constituency every single week, in my personal experience of taking a suicidal relative to a psychiatric ward, and in the trauma that I still experience having been a first responder to a man who took his own life and died on the, on the pavement beside me in our nation's capital. So I do not doubt the sincerity of anybody in this chamber in the spirit in which they approach this uh, debate. Our response should be built around our understanding of the failures of the systems that we've had previously. And presiding officer, I don't think you can find a, a more shocking example than the case of David Ramsey. And we all know that in October 2016, at 50 years old, David was turned away twice from the Carsview Centre in Dundee, despite suicidal tendency and the, the best wishes of his family and his GP for them to see him. He was not just to, turned away, he was told that they had nipped his problems in the bud and to pull himself together to go for a walk. And yet the very next week, David sadly took his own life. If, if there is one silver lining to that tragedy, it is in the uh, formidable work of his niece, Jilly Murray, who has taken up the campaign around suicide prevention. I know she is watching today and I thank her for her efforts. Whilst that's an extreme example, there are many commonalities in David's case with those of other people who experience su suicidal ideation. Um, first of all, he's a man. We know that this is becoming an increasingly gendered issue. 75% of all suicides in Scotland are among men. It is the leading cause of death in men under the age of 50. In fact, there is a success story in the work that this Scottish government and previous Scottish governments have done in the huge reduction uh, among uh, women. In fact, we are, uh, we, we're at a level that we've not seen for decades in terms of the low level of uh, female suicide. But it is the uptick in male suicide that keeps us uh, stubbornly resistant in terms of reduction. 
Um, so we need to look at what we are doing in terms of the offer we give to men. There are some great examples in the voluntary sector of men's sheds and community support work that's going on there. But we also have to recognise that whilst we've got very good at getting men to talk openly about their mental health, there is a cruel irony that, that when they finally come forward and admit they have a problem, there is a gaping void of service provision to offer them in that respect. Similarly, in David's case, many uh, patients struggle with continuity of care. Uh, the Health Committee had very compelling private evidence from families affected and people who had tried to take their own life in the past. And they all said the same thing, that they repeatedly have to tell their life story over and over again to professionals. And it, that is in itself re-traumatizing. You wouldn't expect to have five different cancer surgeons. So why do we have to expect people to make do with five different duty psychiatrists or counselors? I want to close by uh, addressing the substance of our amendment. I think talking therapies are vital here. And whilst technology absolutely has its place, there have been critic criticisms of online uh, self-help um, equipment like beating the blues. But it's not just about introducing psychiatrists. We can give people access to talking therapies by training those around them. And that's about any uh, individual who uh, works with people who are more likely to be at risk of suicide should have that training at their disposal. I want to also close by reflecting on the, the advances, and I, they are advances that this government has made in the field of mental health in the last couple of weeks, particularly around the programme for government. I do welcome the level of investment. It's absolutely needed. But I think also um, we need to, to grapple with the ra reality that if we're fast-tracking people, again, something that is welcome, into beds that aren't staffed properly, then we will only compound problems further. A rejected referral can do untold damage to people who thought they were getting help at, at the end of the tunnel. Uh, but I want to finish on a, a positive note. I do welcome Claire's uh, appointment as minister. I think she meet, brings much needed expertise uh, to this issue. And on that basis, she is assured of our support in the vote tonight. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Can I just remind members to use full names in the chamber? Friendly though you may be, Mr. Cole Hamilton, we know that. I now call Alison Johnson, please. Um, thank you, presiding officer. As we've heard, 680 Scots lost their lives by suicide last year. Now, that is a total that's lower than in previous years, but Samaritans tell us that last year, for the third year running, deaths by suicide increased in young men aged 15 to 24 in Scotland. And, as we've heard, the suicide rate for men in Scotland was over three times that of women, at 77%. Now, the action plan tells us that suicide rates have been falling in children and young people, but it also tells us of worsening self-reporting when it comes to mental well-being amongst our young girls in Scotland. And I, I've been asking friends, colleagues, family, what they believe to be the single biggest killer of men under 50 in the UK. Heart disease, they said. Lung cancer. Is it dementia? And all were surprised to learn that the answer is, in fact, suicide. And, of course, it's all the more shocking when we consider that suicide is preventable. It is not inevitable. And I know that this Parliament agrees that one, one suicide is too many. Yet a Samaritan's poll conducted earlier this year showed that 61% of people in Scotland have been affected by suicide and 29% had experienced the suicide of a friend or a family member or had supported someone dealing with suicidal thoughts. And we would seek to intervene when a friend or a colleague is in poor physical health and we need to get to the position where we know how to help someone dealing with suicidal thoughts. And there will rightly be further focus in this debate on the need to ensure support is available for our young people as and where they need it. Sam H. point out that this is not only about teaching staff, but all school staff. Their recent survey found that two-thirds of teachers hadn't received sufficient training in mental health, and the majority of non-teaching staff hadn't received any training. Now, the recognition in the action plan that CAMS need reformed is as welcome as it is overdue. And the involvement of the Scottish Youth Parliament, the Children and Young People's Mental Health Task Force, the Youth Commission on Mental Health. Um, you know, in this year of young people, the work that's going on with CME, 
the, the recent work of the cross-party group on children and young people, it has a real role to play in addressing and making sure we get this, we really get this right for every child. Um, Fulton McGregor, uh, recently, he, when he was chairing the cross-party group on children and young people, there's a report that's well worth reading. Um, and, and they pointed out the young people in that room. Under the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, children and young people have a right to good health. However, this report highlights that we're failing to uphold this right and shows the scale of the problem we face in relation to children and young people's mental health, with three children in every class experiencing a diagnosable mental health problem by the age of 16, we must do better. And I welcome the fact that this is recognised. The programme for government, of course, spoke of the proposed incorporation of the principles of the UNCRC. And, you know, I think it's absolutely essential that this happens. Like others, I thank Sam H, the Samaritans and Stonewalls for their briefing. All of these organisations are welcoming of the plan, but all have questions on it too. For example, Sam H ask, can the government confirm that the new Scottish Mental Health and Suicide Prevention Training Programme includes provision of skills to actively intervene where someone is experiencing thoughts of suicide? And they're also asking the government's or intentions when it comes to retaining assist. And I'd welcome the Minister's comments when closing. Yes, certainly. Minister? I thank Alison Johnson for taking an intervention on that point. One of the actions of the leadership group is to uh, develop a training, training package for across the country by May next year. And the organisations that she mentions there, Samaritans and Sam H, are on the, the leadership group. So they will have an opportunity to input into what is involved in the training package. Alison thank Johnson. You. Thank you. Um, I thank the Minister for her response. We're also very welcoming of the additional £3 million, but the Samaritans do ask, um, well, they point out that while the ambition and the scope of the plan is laudable, uh, the resources to deliver across the whole plan appear limited, and perhaps the Minister could explain how that £3 million will be spent. Um, presiding officer, I think it, we are all agreed that Every Life Matters is a, it, it's a step in the right direction. The target for further reductions of suicides, the new emphasis on suicide prevention leadership, the focus on young people, the recognition of training of those working in our social security system, for example. Um, these are welcome steps in the right direction. But there is further detail needed. I spoke earlier of the worsening self-reported mental well-being, um, especially in young girls. We've seen a very worrying increase in self-harm amongst young people and among young girls in particular. And self-harm is strongly associated with a lifetime risk of suicide, as Claire Hawhey will be aware. And the Growing Up in Scotland survey shows that almost a quarter of young women have self-harmed. So uh, self-harm does feature in the strategy, as I was assured it would by ministers during previous debates, but I don't think it features as strongly as could be the case. It's not, for instance, mentioned in any of the actions, uh, though there's some brief reference elsewhere. And nor does there seem to be a specific strategy for how we'll work towards reducing the levels of self-harm we see, especially among young people. And I'd appreciate the Minister's comments on that too. Um, I think the committee was very shocked to hear from Tony Giuliano that, that there can be waiting times for up to 12 weeks for psychological therapies when a family member or friend has taken their own life and the person is vulnerable and at risk. So I'd like to understand what the Minister intends to do um, to make sure that those figures improve markedly. Presiding officer, in closing, Greens welcome the strategy and the renewed focus on reducing the still far too high number of people in Scotland who sadly take their own lives. But I look forward to the Minister addressing the points I've raised in closing. Thank you. Thank you. Move to the open debate. Speeches of six minutes. Claire Adamson, followed by Brian Whittle. Miss Adamson, please. Thank you very much, presiding officer. Um, I very much welcome um, the opportunity to, to contribute to the debate this afternoon and the strategy that has been brought forward by the Scottish Government. Um, I've listened to the comments about um, us not having a strategy in place for some kind um, and the delay following the draft publication. However, I think the, the government has to be commended for listening to the sector, to listening to the concerns about the draft um, publication and, and actually working to produce a document that has been um, widely um, regarded as, as a, a step forward in this direction. And um, I certainly welcome it. Um, 
from a personal point of view. My own constituency, unfortunately, has recently um, been affected by a number of suicides and something that has affected, as Claire Hockey said, every aspect of our community, um, schools, friends, families, colleagues, everyone who have been involved in that process. And it really brings home to you what, what a tragedy and what a shock um, someone completing suicide can be for, for the community that they live in. I just want to talk a little bit about what's happened since then in my own area. And I want to commend Motherwell Football Club. I'm going to read a tweet that they put out um, uh, in the 18th of July. Um, we need to talk about suicide. A number of young people close to us have recently lost their lives. We want others to know that there is always another way and help is available. And it gives a link to the North Lanarkshire support um, webpage for suicide prevention. And what strikes me about, about this is, is that much of the act, many of the action points and much of what the government has been talking about is that partnership working. And this has to be about working with partners, working with all uh, aspects of our community um, to try and prevent further suicides. Um, Motherwell Football Club, um, including their manager, Stephen Robinson, produced a video that is available on YouTube and on, on their Facebook, where um, some of the um, the um, players talk quite openly about their experience of su suicide and ent encourage young supporters, young fans and young people taking part in football to, um, to bring, the, bring their um, concerns forward and to talk about their concerns before it gets to a crisis point in their lives. And it's not just Motherwell Football Club. I, I attended the launch of the suicide prevention strategy that Motherwell, Adrianians, Albion Rovers and Clyde have all adopted and they will be wearing suicide prevention logo t-shirts on their kits for the um for this term of the uh, of the, the football season and they are also um openly providing information and support at the football stadiums for people about where they can contact and get help um, and this is all part of the we need to talk about suicide strategy from north lanarkshire council um, it's something that I have been involved with for a number of years myself and um, most of my staff have either undergone assist or safe talk training, something that I would encourage all members to if they have an opportunity to take up um, that training opportunity for themselves and their staff. Um, it, it's, it's, it's very profound training, it's very uh, intense for a couple of days of your life, but absolutely invaluable in teaching sort of life skills about how to support and help someone and point, more, more importantly, point someone in the direction of where they can get help. If I could concentrate on a couple of the action points, I wish I could talk about them all, I can't, I'm gonna to have to be careful today. But um, action point four, which talks about the support for families. Now I know there are a number of organizations in North Lanarkshire that have been working um, both to prevent the suicide and support young people from the landed peer support group, FAMS, we have a, a, a charity called Chris's House in Wishaw for suicide prevention. But I know that the community felt, even though all this work was going on, that they didn't know enough about it. So the fact that there's going to be specialist support and help for friends and families um, if someone completes suicide is so vitally important. And also, I think that's why the um, public awareness campaign in Action Point 3 is going to be so vitally important, so that people understand what is happening. Um, I want to commend North Lanarkshire Council through the Choose Life Project, who um, have organised a five-a-side football tournament every year, focusing on, on men's health and um, men's mental health. And um, that, that you know, a lot of organisations have come along, from people from McDonald's to um, you know the local football clubs to um, uh, some of the third sector organisations bring together teams. It's almost a 24-hour event in Ravenscraig Football Club. But interestingly, a couple of years ago, they began inviting their fifth and sixth year boys. And I think that was such an important message to be sending to the schools that the, the support is out there and, and that there's um, help and people there to support them. Um, I also just want to, to, to commend one other aspect of what North Lanarkshire are actually doing um, and um, it's a, a very simple pad that they've produced, it's almost like a post-it pad but in each of the bits of paper um, there is um, a, a message of are you feeling low, are you having suicidal thoughts, it has support for the uh, contacts for Samaritans, Breathing Place, Childline, 
but also very, very pertinent to Action Point 6, the North Lanarkshire app that is free to download for suicide prevention, as well as their online and web support. So um, I, I really am um, so pleased to see the publication of this report and to hear it so, so warmly welcomed in the, in the chamber this afternoon, because I really think it's a step forward in reducing people com completing suicide. Thank you very much. And I call Brian Whittle to be followed by Angela Constance. Mr Whittle, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I do welcome the opportunity to speak in this debate. And although we've made great strides in breaking down the stigma of poor mental health, suicide remains a difficult subject to broach and continues to carry a certain stigma for those caught in its grip, perceived or otherwise. However, the reality, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, that statistically it is likely that the majority of members in this chamber have been affected by suicide at one time or another. So it is right that we're taking the time to debate the Scottish Government's suicide prevention plan. And it's already been mentioned in this chamber, suicide remains a main cause of avoidable death in Scotland, especially young males aged 24 to 50. Scotland does have the highest suicide rates in the UK, so it is welcome that the Scottish Government have come forward uh, with this action plan. And we welcome uh, the contents of that action plan as well. However, what I wanted to, to take the time here is, is, is to suggest that I think there's an element of the plan missing, and I want to take the short time that I have, Deputy Presiding Officer, to speak to the importance of an overall health strategy and its potential impact on issues such as suicide. If you read Sam H's uh, a publication called uh, Scotland's Mental Health Charter for Physical Activity, they state, and I quote, physical activity through sport or recreation has been proven to have a positive impact on physical and mental, well, uh, mental health and well-being. Research suggests that the less physical activity a person does, the more likely they are to experience low mood, depression, tension or worry. And this is backed up by uh, James Joplin, who is the Samaritans Executive Director for Scotland. He says, and again a quote, physical activity can provide mental health and well-being benefits of itself, but can also provide an environment for individuals to connect with other people and providing an, an antidote for some of feelings of social isolation and loneliness. Being physically active is a cornerstone of preventing the decline into poor mental health and also uh, as part of the treatment for those already suffering. Sam H are absolutely clear in their commitment to physical activity being part of a mental health strategy. It's quite clear from their presentation that removing barriers to participation in physical activity and sport is a priority and that means those groups with specific needs must be given solutions that fit their situation. It's also very clear from research that the part that basic healthy diet has uh, has a significant impact on mental health. In the Mental Health Foundation's presentation, Food for Thought, they state that one of the most obvious yet under-recognised factors in the development of mental health is nutrition, and that there is a growing body of evidence indicating that nutrition plays an important role in the prevention, development and management of diagnosed mental health problems, including depression, anxiety, schizophrenia, attention defi uh, deficit hyperactivity disorder and dementia. So it is necessary for individuals, uh, practitioners and policy makers to make sense of the relationship between mental health and diet so we can make informed choices. Not only about promoting and maintaining good mental health but also increasing awareness of the potential for poor nutrition to be a factor in stimulating or maintaining poor health. As part of the Health and Sports Committee's investigation, I, I visited Cardonnell College with uh, Sandra White, actually, and got the opportunity to hear from a group of students who had all, at some point, contemplated or, or attempted suicide. During that very raw discussion, they highlighted the fact that they knew what things they could do to help themselves. They knew, for instance, that taking exercise is a major way to combat poor mental health. They knew that eating properly uh, can have a major impact on their well-being because the doctor said. But as one woman's, young woman said to me, although she was very aware of the positive impact that getting out of bed and going for a walk would have on her demeanour or having a healthy breakfast, she couldn't make herself get out of bed, safe to microwave a frozen pizza at some point during the day. It's not enough to point to a solution. There has to be easy access with the individual in mind. In fact, it happens that the group themselves managed to find a solution by deciding to work together and exercise together. So we're talking about social inclusion, that, that sort of uh, group commitment. See, I always thought it's, it's the responsibility of a government to create that environment where that opportunity exists for everyone, irrespective of background or personal circumstance. 
But the harder bit of that is it, it must also ensure that all are aware of these opportunities and have the knowledge, confidence, capability and aspiration to make those choices. There are so many moving parts to health and well-being. It's no secret that I think education has a huge uh, footprint in health, and I think that, that that's represented in the government's uh, strategy we're discussing today, especially in that, that preventable health agenda. We are debating a suicide prevention strategy today, but actually, I think what we're debating is health. And I've always, I'm always going to say that I think physical activity and nutrition and inclusivity should be the basis of any health strategy. I think the Scottish Government's suicide strategy, strategy is, in fact, only going halfway. I, I, like many of the other strategies, I think it proposes to deal with those whose health has already deteriorated to a very low level. And I think we need to think about how we address, in another way, how we prevent sufferers entering that downward spiral. I think uh, if, I, if I quote uh, Dr. David Kingdom, who is the Professor of uh, Healthcare Delivery at the University of Southampton, he says, can we prevent mental health problems? Of course. The evidence is incontrovertible, so why don't we? The problems often start in childhood, and we spend most of our resources on dealing with the consequences in and out of hospital and prisons. I would add to that by saying we also deal with the we're also dealing with the consequences in this debate we are having today. While I warmly welcome the government's publication of its suicide prevention strategy, I think we in these benches believe it relates only to half of half of the solution. I think, I think we need to start considering and how we look at solutions within an overall cohesive health of the nation approach. Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. I call Angela Constance to be followed by David Stewart. Ms Constance, please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. It's uh, a privilege to participate in today's debate. Uh, difficult though it is to talk about suicide because as others have reflected, it will have touched all of our lives in many ways, I do not doubt. But talk, listen and act, we must. And I will always carry with me uh, my experience as a social worker and mental health officer. In particular, uh, the very first time that I made uh, what was then known as a Section 18 application under the old uh, 1984 Mental Health Scotland Act uh, to the Sheriff Court to detain in hospital uh, a young woman against her will and it was me who made the case uh, to the court that this young woman needed to be in hospital to receive treatment and care that she would otherwise refuse to reduce the risk uh, of harm uh, to herself and a few months later she took her own life so was that the right decision uh, the wrong decision or just the least wrong decision so we all need to have uh, the courage uh, to review and learn uh, from all uh, deaths by suicide. And I would also suggest uh, those cases where people have uh, attempted uh, to take their lives. Uh, and I'm pleased to see uh, the case reviews feature prominently in the Suicide Prevention Action Plan. I also remember, presiding officer, my old boss saying to me that mental illness, uh, like physical illness, can sometimes be tragically uh, terminal. And while my old boss it wasn't wrong. We still have to proceed uh, with that steely determination that suicide is preventable uh, and that no death uh, by suicide is acceptable or inevitable. So I want to pay tribute to frontline staff who have to make uh, very difficult decisions and judgment calls. Uh, something I'm sure the Minister will well understand, uh, particularly uh, as her frontline experience is more enduring uh, and recent than mine. And it is, of course, the efforts of staff in the voluntary sector, in public services and carers that have resulted in a 20% decrease in the rate of suicide in the past 15 years. Although, as we've heard, male suicide has increased consecutively over each of the every past three years. And like the Samaritans, I welcome the commitment to reduce the suicide rate by a further 20% uh, by 2022, although I struggle with the concept of a target when every uh, life matters. But uh, we know that the greater uh, ambition is to achieve transformational change. And of course, uh, with the high suicide rate in Great Britain, make no mistake about it, it is transformational change uh, that is required. And the Suicide Prevention Action Plan makes crystal clear that this has to be a national priority. And none of this can be achieved with 
Without the reform of services, I think Sam H make an interesting point uh, about the responsibility for local prevention plans, uh, sitting with the reformed public health service. Inclusion Scotland uh, point to the importance of community planning partnerships uh, and the Minister herself said that this isn't just uh, about uh, health services. And like others, uh, I very much uh, welcome the additional uh, investment in resources uh, and in terms of increasing uh, the mental health workforce uh, is a substantial uh, commitment by anyone's standards. Because we know you can't deliver the right service to the right person at the right time without staff and without investment. But you also need something far more than inputs to uh, deliver a, a person-centred, flexible, responsive service that is built on lived experience. And I have lost count of the number of people I have worked with, either as a social worker or as a constituency MSP, who, despite they or their families uh, reaching out for help because they instinctively knew that something was wrong, only to be turned away because they didn't fit the criteria uh, or the diagnosis. And preventative services don't turn folk away because the consequences, as we know, can be catastrophic. And suicide prevention has to be everyone's business. And it is uh, difficult to untangle and align the role of universal statutory services with more specialist support, as well as growing community-based support, uh, shifting the balance towards more preventative measures, all in the context of growing demand. But sometimes it's small, common sense changes that can make a huge difference. And I visited the Scottish War Blinded Centre in Lynburn in my constituency uh, last week and the support that they provide uh, to veterans is life changing and on occasion uh, life saving. And the good news is that they want to do more and they're not even asking government or any statutory service for more money. They can do more if we can find a way to identify veterans earlier who are registered as blind or visually impaired. And I do hope that's something that the Minister could perhaps uh, help with. Poseidon Officer, the, the biggest challenge that the, the Minister um, is facing is to ensure that the strategy and the additional investment has maximum impact uh, on frontline services uh, and communities. And I know that stakeholders and opposition MSPs are asking questions about the role and authority uh, of the National Leadership Group. Uh, and of course, questions uh, will have to be answered and the Minister has begun to do that in our interventions today. But uh, I know ultimately that it is ministers that are accountable to this parliament. And in this instance, we all have to recognise that the responsibility uh, for ministers uh, is indeed a heavy one. And yes, I, like other parliamentarians, will have my tuppence worth. Uh, I believe it's called scrutiny and accountability. But hopefully I won't sound too much like a backseat uh, driver. Uh, but the minister uh, will always uh, have my support. And I think, judging by the tone and tenor of today's debate, she'll also have the support of other members too. Thank you very much. And I call David Stewart, who followed by Bob Doris. Mr Stewart, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer, and could I welcome the Minister, Claire Hockey, to her post, and I wish her well in her future endeavours. Uh, President Officer, over uh, 40 years ago, as a fresh-faced young man in my early 20s, I, I joined the Samaritans in my home city of uh, Inverness. I'd been inspired by an article I read by the Samaritans founder, the Reverend Chad Vara. He was the vicar of St Stephen's Church uh, in London, but his first ever funeral was a 14-year-old girl who died by suicide. The tragic death drove him to prevent future suicide. So in 1953, he set up 999 for the suicidal. He was a man willing to listen with a base and an emergency telephone. Now the service received substantial press coverage. The Daily Mirror coined the term telephone good Samaritans and the name stuck, becoming synonymous with volunteers who were there for others who were struggling to cope. Now, I trained with more experienced local Samaritans. Their philosophy was simple but effective, provide a safe space so that people could talk and be listened to without judgment. I did night shifts, day shifts, weekends, and holidays. I learned from watching, listening, and observing older, more experienced volunteers. Presiding officer, near all the calls were heartbreaking from the lost and the lonely, the sad and the sorrowful, the young, the old, the rich and the poor. My youngest caller was 15, my oldest 75. But today the inspiring work continues. 
The Samaritans have over 200 branches across the UK and the Republic of Ireland, still operating on Chadvaris' framework of a confidential, non-judgmental support. As we've heard from other speakers, everyone's job is to prevent suicide, not to walk on the other side of the street, as in the parable of the Good Samaritan. And as the Samaritans say in the briefing for this debate, suicide is not inevitable, it's preventable, and concerted action can save lives. Now, historically, Scotland has led the way with suicide prevention strategy. In 2002, Choose Life was set up, perhaps the most ambitious and comprehensive plan to tackle suicide in the Western world. A large research study uh, to support the implementation of Choose Life was undertaken by Edinburgh, Dundee and St Andrews Universities. This covered the years from 1989 to 2004. And in the findings, which were very shocking, if we go back to that period, we find that suicide rates for males had gone up by over a fifth and for females by 6%. And there was regional issues beside an officer. In Glasgow, the suicide rate was significantly higher than the Scottish average in all years, in both men and women. And also of concerns were uh, rates of death by suicide, which were disproportionately high in my own region of Highlands and Islands, for with Highlands, Western Isles and Nag Island Butte were well above the Scottish average, which was 13.5 deaths per 100,000. Highland had a rate of 17.5 deaths, Western Isles was 17.1, and Orkney was 19.4. And in the study, and it's not changed much today, it showed that male rates were three times higher than female, male vulnerability was greater in more rural and remote areas, and clearly, as other speakers have identified, a clear link between suicide and social economic depri deprivation. My view is that suicide is a class, health and inequality issue. Unless we tackle inequality, we cannot get to the root of the problem. But if you drill down into the statistics, you will find that the poorest men in the poorest communities in Scotland have a suicide rate that is 10 times greater than that of the wealthiest men in the wealth in communities. And as the Scottish Public Health Observatory have argued, suicide is the leading cause of death among people aged 15 to 34 years old, a quarter of male deaths and one fifth of female deaths were because of death by suicide. So suicide prevention needs to be embedded in all key government functions. And as the Samaritan said to the Health and Sport Committee in June, not every suicide prevention project has the title plastered above the door. And Dan Proverbs from Brothers in Arms, a men's mental health charity working across Scotland, spoke to the committee and made it clear, clear that inequality is an issue, but so is gender. He calls it brothers hiding in plain sight. Men putting on a mask at work and in social associations to hide their true feelings of isolation, loss and depression. And the Mental Health Foundation Scotland's recent report called on the UK government to conduct an impact assessment of its austerity agenda and to look closely at the impact of, mental, uh, of, of welfare reform on mental health. So there's clear evidence that the austerity agenda and welfare reform has a significant impact on individuals' mental health. And the suicide prevention plan, of course, should be welcomed and in particular support the target to further reduce the rate of suicide by 20%. So the big picture in conclusion, presiding officer, is clear. Every suicide is a suicide too many. We must understand the social determinants of poverty and inequality and our suicide prevention policy should be embedded in all policies that government engender. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Stewart. I call Bob Doris to be followed by Bill Bowman. Mr Doris, please. Thank you very much, President Officer. It's a, it's a pleasure uh, to speak in this afternoon's debate on the Suicide Prevention Action Plan of the Relief Matter. It's also quite humbling. Like, m much of the, the narrative this afternoon has been drawn from personal experiences rather than from sound bites, which is good for this chamber. It's what we should draw upon when we debate policy and something as important as this. I hope to uh, cover three areas uh, as best I can in relation to some preventative actions that we could take uh, how we learn from suicides and what training there could be. All of those are in the action plan itself. And a while back in this chamber, I mentioned a part of my constituency, which it would appear may be an area of particular concern with regards to levels of suicide. It would be a location of interest, if, if you like. And the locations of interest are, are traditionally known as places like rivers, bridges and roads, rather than the communities themselves. And I think that's my first focus. We have to look at some of the communities themselves, which have to become locations of interest. When I made that contribution 
in, in the chamber a while back, I named the place and I, I was told gently and supportively that sometimes naming the place is not the best thing to do because that in itself could draw attention to an area and a focus for people to go to, to take their own life or draw attention for those who are considering to take their own lives and push them beyond that into committing the, the final act. So there's a great sensitivity uh, that we have to deal with when we, when we discuss this matter. But I did raise a, a particular area of, of my constituency and I note that Action 7 in the Action Plan is that leadership group will identify and facilitate prevention actions targeted at risk groups and I have only mentioned some of the risk groups for time constraints but depri deprivation, poverty and social exclusion, isolation, living with or developing an impairment or long term condition, people affected with drugs and alcohol, eh, migrants, homelessness and there are others, no discourtesy to others that I haven't mentioned. But that would pretty much look like a strong demographic for many, many parts of, of my constituency. So when we talk about locations of interest, perhaps we have to get a bit community-based rather than just site-based. And I think that's the first point I would make. And the £3 million innovation fund is absolutely welcome in how we do innovative work around uh, suicide prevention. But an area-based grassroots approach to some of that resilience work, I think would be a really positive way forward. Uh, and I see the Samaritans are saying similar things. And obviously we'd like further clarity and reading from their, their brief here on the authority of the group that will make decisions and the allocation of that funding that I mentioned, the setting of priorities, high risk groups to target new activity and the support direction and evaluation to deliver effective activity locally. And the key word is locally. Um, and, and the Samaritans, great organisation, heavily volunteer led. Just imagine what local coordinators, capacity builders and communities from the Samaritans or other similar organisations could do in leading a community resilience strategy in areas of concern of interest that are at higher risk of, of, of uh, suicide. I would certainly appreciate localised grassroots work in my constituency from them or others as part of that £3 million pot of cash over the years ahead. Uh, I see that Action 9 uh, uh, in relation to the action plan says the Scottish Government will work closely with the uh, partners to ensure that data, evidence and guidance is used to maximise impact. Improvement methodology will support localities to better understand and minimise unwarranted variation in practice and outcomes. That again puts us back to that community-based approach uh, to, to suicide prevention because uh, the, 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 un the variation in outcomes may be demographic based, based on some of the risk factors that's in the strategy itself. Um, can I look at Action 10, please, Presiding Officer, in relation to reviewing of all deaths by suicide? Um, at, at that learning experience, um, and, and I thank the Minister Claire Hawke, also welcome, welcome to her, her new position. Uh, I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed the, her, her op opening speech. Uh, but any review of deaths by suicide, and I've written to the Minister in relation to this, who's replied, has to be one that is based with partnership working. It has to be open. It has to be not siloed and it has to be not defensive. Uh, and I don't have a specific constituent who I don't have permission to name in the chamber today, but the constituent issues with how community health, health services did or didn't help uh, a loved one, their, their mother who took her own life. Um, there was a significant incident review around that. Also concerned about the long-term approach from her GPs, from NHS 24, or from the NHS in relation to discharge. We take a step back and look at the bigger picture, you ask, Who's reviewing the bigger picture when someone tragically takes their own life? And whatever we do in relation to Action 10 about reviewing all deaths by suicide, we have to take a step back, not be bunkered, and we have to look at the bigger picture. And I don't actually think the, the infrastructure we have in place is necessarily very adept to doing that. So maybe some new thinking along those lines. The time I've got left, I'd like to look at uh, Action 2. Uh, which talks about funding the creation and implementation of a refreshed mental health and suicide prevention strategy by May 2019 uh, and support delivery across public and private sectors. I don't have training in, in, in mental health awareness. I think I should have taken opportunities that were available for me. I apologise for not doing that. It should probably be mandatory for MSPs, quite frankly, and perhaps were staff uh, as well. Uh, there are many, many vulnerable people that I, I, I deal with on a weekly basis. I'm not always sure how best to support them. I'm not always sure that statutory organisations uh, cover themselves in glory when I raise the deep 
serious concerns that I have. I would certainly like a bespoke referral pathway for MSPs when vulnerable constituents come to me and I can't always say to them, I think there's something wrong, you have to seek help and I don't always have the skills to do that. And I actually need advice for the best interests of my constituents. And we're talking about training and implementation of that. Think about the policy makers and the, re the representatives in this place as well. Thank you, Presiding Officer, uh, and I look forward to supporting the motion and the amendments this afternoon. Thank you very much. I call Bill Bowman, who will be followed by Emma Harper. Mr Bowman, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. As we go through this debate, certain topics come up um, and are mentioned by many speakers. I welcome the Suicide Prevention Action Plan with its 10 action points. Clear Hockey states in the foreword to the plan that the Scottish Government believes that no death by suicide should be regarded as acceptable or inevitable. I think it is important that this statement is remembered and in the forefront of our thinking and does not get lost in the words that follow as the plan implementation is, is described. Data on suicides is routinely collected and analysed by the National Records of Scotland and the Scottish Public Health Observatory. There are some promising statistics. Suicide rates in Scotland have reduced by 18% over the last 10 years. But as Angela Constance said, every life matters when discussing things like statistics. Despite the domestic downward trend in suicides, suicide and self-harm continue to be a major public health issues in Scotland. Around two people die by suicide in Scotland every day, every day. What's more is that almost unbelievably, almost two out of three um, Scots have some experience of suicide, and I'd say myself included. A worrying fact that ministers, I'm sure, will, will pay heed to. Mental health problems are one of the main issues that need to be addressed as part of suicide prevention strategy. For example, in my region, only a third of Tayside children waiting for mental health treatment were seen within 18 weeks in the last quarter. The target is for 90% to be seen within this time frame. NHS Tayside's performance at 34% is the worst in Scotland. Treatment is crucial, of course, but we must also tackle the underlying reasons why so many people take their own lives. Um, for example, those living in the most deprived areas are more than three times likely to die by suicide than those living in the least deprived areas. I think David Stewart gave us some insight into that also. It's a particular challenge also, unfortunately, in, in my region in Dundee, which has amongst the highest levels of deprivation in Scotland, which is apparent in the statistics showing that in Dundee, suicide deaths rose, rose by 61% from 2015 to 2016. It's important for the Scottish Government to consider how it plans to provide suicide prevention training across the public and private sector. Clare Hockey has said that the National Suicide Prevention Leadership Group will consider detail on this and make recommendations to ministers on the most appropriate focus for the refreshed training, which is to be developed under Action 2 in the plan. Now, the minister has mentioned the railways as an example, and suicides on the railways are a prominent issue in Scotland. I have met with a train driver who experienced suicide while doing his job and discussed the ways that this can be tackled. Thankfully, railways and train companies are taking action and making progress. Network Rail, the train operating companies, trade unions, British Transport Police, the Railway Mission and Railway Safety and Standards Board have been proactively working with the Samaritans since 2010 to reduce suicides on the railways and to support anyone involved in the aftermath of a railway suicide. By the end of 2016-17, over 4,500 frontline railway personnel had been trained on how to intervene to prevent suicide attempts, and around 1,575 personnel have been trained in trauma support. ScotRail also hold regular awareness events at major stations to raise awareness and engage people in conversations about mental health, and this is to be commended. Set out in the suicide Prevention Action Plan is a vision to provide better support to those bereaved by suicide. One of my constituents has experienced the loss of the life of someone close to her through suicide and states that the lack of support provided after an instance like this is a widespread problem. There can often be a stigma attached, to, attached pardon me, and many people find themselves isolated after losing a loved one through suicide. She wrote to me and said, 
I've experienced bereavement in the past, but the agony that comes after suicide is beyond description. The pain, confusion, guilt, and anger is immense, and it's a lonely place to be. When you lose someone under natural circumstances, you get flowers and sympathy cards. With suicide, it's almost like being a leper. This particular constituent also says that she was given in terms of that the all she was given in terms of support was antidepressants and sedatives. There were no regular appointments to check how she was coping and whether she needed help. I can only imagine the feeling of deep loneliness and I hope the new strategy makes situations like this a thing of the past. And so we welcome the fact that the Scottish Government has finally published its Suicide Prevention Action Plan. The previous plan had expired in 2016, leaving Scotland without a suicide strategy for over a year and a half, which is not really acceptable. However, now that the action plan has been published, it is imperative that the SNP deliver the action plan quickly and effectively, with no further delays in order to tackle problems such as those I've raised today. If I can repeat the statement from Claire Hockey in the introduction, no death by suicide should be regarded as inevitable or acceptable and ask that we keep this at the forefront of our thoughts. Thank you. Call Emma Harper to be followed by Monica Lennon. Thank you, President Officer. I'm pleased to be able to speak in today's debate and I'd like to remind Chamber that I'm a nurse, but I'm also Deputy Convener of the Health and Sport Committee. And I too welcome the Minister to her new role. Every life does matter and suicide is preventable and the Minister has said this already. Suicide is an extremely difficult subject to speak about and just one person taking their life is one too many. And many of us across Chamber have already described personal experience and I listened quite intently to Angela Constance, my colleague, about her experience in her job prior to coming here. But many of us have had constituents who have presented even with thoughts of ending their own life themselves. And it's our job to be there, to help, to support and to listen to anyone who presents with mental health needs. I'd like to focus my comments today on two aspects. And it's the causes of suicide and then suicide prevention, particularly in rural areas. I represent the South Scotland region. It's rural. I often tell people I cover Feed and Bar, and Rar. It's a rural region. And when assessing the government's Every Life Matters Action Plan, I specifically looked for evidence to support rural interventions. And the National Guidance on Suicide Prevention a planning tool is um, actually part of the, the guidance that has been um, set out in the national plan. And this national guidance on suicide prevention in rural areas is presented so that we can look at tackling suicide and prevention specifically in rural areas. And it needs to be used in, in conjunction with part two, which sets out the evidence-based approach. There is rationale for focusing on rural suicide. There has been significant changes over recent years in terms of ageing population, a decline in farm incomes, economic pressures to diversify, increased environment pressures and associated legislation, along with depopulation of some areas and changing labour markets, as well as increased international competition. But no single pattern has emerged in the research as yet as to specific rural causes of suicide. Earlier this year, I had the opportunity to meet with former MSP Jim Hume, who is chairman of Support in Mind. And Support in Mind is a, it's a, a charity that's carrying out vital work to support those working in the agricultural sector who are experiencing depression, feelings of isolation and suicidal thoughts. They do this by working collaboratively with NHS boards, third sector organisations and others, mainly by listening to people, directing them to professional support and by reminding them that someone is there to help. I'd like to give recognition also to another group, another organisation to support our rural communities, and that's the Royal Agricultural, the Royal Scottish Agricultural Benevolent Institution. It's also known as RASABI. Earlier this year, I met with CEO Nina Clancy, and Nina said that Rasabi aims to provide relief for hardship and even poverty to those working in Scottish agriculture. To date, it has helped many farmers, crofters and agricultural workers who may also be experiencing symptoms of poor mental health. Rasabi has also engaged with Police Scotland to work with firearm licence officers who have agreed to provide Rasabi contact information when carrying out firearm checks. 
and that's quite important. However, presiding officer, out of the 680 Scots who have taken their own life, 20 of those lived in Dumfries and Galloway, and they took their own life in 2016. Two thirds of them were men. And today I won't repeat statistics, but I want to focus on the fact that behind each number is a person, an individual and their family, all of whom are affected by this tragedy. This is why it's extremely important for authorities, government and healthcare professionals to learn from each experience, to listen to families and to implement effective policies to ensure such an event is not repeated. I welcome the commitment to mental health first aid training. I will endeavour to engage in it myself. As a general nurse, I have not had any engagement in this type of training myself, but I will be happy to participate in the training and support others to do so. So the training will allow for the creation of mental health first aid responders who can be trained to provide immediate emergency support. And Alec Cole Hamilton mentioned the importance of talking therapy which is really important, face-to-face -face therapy. But I've also seen digital technology that can be used, such as an app called the Thrive app. And I, look, I found it while I was researching the Brothers in Arms information page. And one of the comments on the app noted, it's not just Brothers in Arms, it's for sisters too. Would you like to take an intervention on that? Absolutely. Alex Cole Hamilton. I'm very grateful to Emma Harper for taking my intervention. Does the member agree with me that, uh, that whilst there are great apps out there, that things like Beating the Blues, which is the go-to online referral uh, technology, which is used by NHS Scotland, is regarded by stakeholders as being somewhat out of date? Emma Harper. I thank Alex Cole Hamilton for that intervention. Um, I'm sure there are apps that have been used in the past that are a bit out of date. I think there is importance in, in engaging with whatever tools we can that will get people to talk and one of the the evidence I learned from the brothers in arms was that a lot of men don't want to talk but a wee app is somewhere that can open the door to access to proper professional help and treatment so I welcome your intervention thank you there's been a local group established in my area called uh, the Retired Farmers, and it's organised by Jill Rennie with Health and Wellbeing Funding. And its job is to participate with uh, a collaborative approach with uh, Theresa Dougal, who's the manager for NFU Scotland. And Theresa and Jill have been widening the participation for retired farmers, and specifically they're looking at uh, dealing with isolation. So, presiding officer, I know the time is short, so. Finally, I'd like to take the opportunity to, to welcome the 10 action items, the comprehensive measures set out in the programme for government to tackle mental health issues and welcome the commitments in the suicide plan. And I look forward to seeing the actions implemented and scrutinising these as part of the Health and Sport Committee. And I look forward to the evidence of maximum impact of this because again, every life does matter and suicide is absolutely preventable. Paul Monica Lennon to be followed by Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I'm grateful to the Presiding Officers for prior permission to uh, be excused for the earlier part of the debate that allowed me to stick to a prior engagement with the Cabinet Secretary for Finance and Economy, so I am grateful, but I'm sorry to have missed the, the earlier speeches, and I join others in welcoming Claire Hockey to her ministerial role, and also put on record my appreciation to Maureen Watt for all her um, assistance uh, in, in the past. Um, also, um, I'm sure like others have, have said, I express my sympathy to, to anyone who's lost a loved one um, to suicide. I know that this, this debate will be quite challenging to listen to at, at times. So the updated suicide prevention plan published by the government over the summer is, is very welcome. The steps outlined, outlined by the Scottish Government are encouraging and I'm pleased at the views of stakeholders such as Samaritan Scotland who gave feedback on the earlier draft of the plan have been taken on uh, board and addressed. And I commend the Minister for her consideration of earlier critiques and producing a plan with, with more ambition and leadership at the national level. This is welcome. But it's clear we still have a significant amount of work to do to reduce Scotland's suicide rate. We know that we have to do better. It is a complete tragedy that Scotland's suicide rate remains so high, higher than the rest of the UK, and men, especially middle-aged men, most at risk of others have said. Suicide is preventable, and each death by suicide 
is a tragedy, creating a, a wave of, of devastation which affects countless people who are left behind. This was brought into a sharp focus for me in recent months after a constituent turned to me for, for help following the death of her partner by suicide. My constituent, Luke Kenderson, completed suicide at the end of last year, just three days after Christmas. And this was despite presenting at health services eight times in the week before he died. His partner, Karen, who's the mother of their two young children, has been incredibly brave in, in speaking out publicly about what she sees as a series of failures uh, to secure help for Luke. Um, help which she feels could almost certainly have saved his life. Luke had a, a history of, of poor mental health and had struggled with addiction, but he was passed from pillar to post. He was turned away from GP services, from A&E, eventually being referred to addiction services with a promise that this would help, only to get there and find out he had to fill in more forums and was sent on his way again. And it was in the early hours of that final um, morning, of that final appointment, that Luke sadly completed suicide at the family home. The initial review of Luke's death by NHS Lanarkshire found that staff had followed all the procedures. Having re reviewed much of Luke's paperwork firsthand and having supported his partner Karen and her mission to get answers from the health board over the last few months, I found that conclusion deeply troubling to say the least, because if that conclusion was to be accepted, then it's never been clear to me that it's the procedures themselves which need urgent review. Um, after several months of, of working on this, I am pleased that NHS Lanarkshire um, has agreed to a further review and it is um, underway. And I'm extremely grateful to the First Minister after I, I raised Luke's experience um, at First Minister's Questions last week and that she agreed to ask the Mental Health Minister to, to meet with Karen um, my office has made contact with the government to set that meeting up and I look forward to meeting with the Minister alongside Karen to discuss Luke's case um, to ensure that any appropriate action which needs to be taken in the aftermath of this ongoing review is taken. Luke's case underlines to me so much of the, the human tragedy um, linked with suicide and the lessons that, that services have to learn, especially in light of the new actions proposed in the action plan. The plan certainly is ambitious, um, but I think we all feel that the, the target of reaching a 20% reduction in suicide by 2020 um, can only be achieved if the allocation of, of, of resources is, is sufficient. So, like others, I'm, I'm really pleased about the commitment to roll out refreshed mental health and suicide prevention training for NHS staff from next year. And again, you know, like others, I would seek clarity on how that annual £1 million will be allocated and how quickly it will be rolled out. Um, and I think that the point that, that Bob Doris made is, is a really important one. My own staff have um, undertaken the, the SAMH uh, training that was provided uh, in, in Parliament. And I know that other MSPs have been speaking about this kind of training, so I think it's something that, that we all would, would benefit from. Um, the Action Plan also commits the leadership group to ensure that there are appropriate reviews into all deaths by suicide. And again, I, I welcome this, but I think for the reviews to be truly meaningful, they have to take into account the views of, of family members. Um, and again, I think, you know, referring back to, to, to Karen and Luke Henderson case, that, 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 that really comes across strongly to me. Um, I know others will have spoken about young people in particular and, you know, the, the latest, the latest CAM statistics, you know, they really are, are woeful and, and worrying. And I think, you know, it just depends on, on all of us, the job that, that we all have to do um, collectively, particularly to make sure that, that young people are not being left behind. And also the fact that one in four adults are waiting more than 18 weeks for psychological therapies. Um, lastly, um, besides an officer, I know I have to, to finish. There's some really great work going on. I, I would um, commend to, to the Minister the work that Place to Be um, are doing, um, in particular Beckford Primary in, in Hamilton, which I know is not far from the Minister to get to, doing really good work um, where young people do benefit from that early intervention. On these benches, obviously, we're delighted with the commitment to roll out school-based counselling in all schools. So, again, I welcome the Suicide Prevention Action Plan and... Um, yeah, I look forward to working with the Minister on this case and, and others. Thank you.
Kenneth Gibson, followed by Maurice Corey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm grateful to have the opportunity today to return to an issue I first brought to the Chamber in 1999. Progress has been made since that first question, when more deaths of males under 35 in the preceding year were due to suicide, 268 than were caused by motor vehicle accidents and drugs combined. And as we've heard this afternoon, between 2002-06 and 2013-17, suicide rates fell by 20%, and in 2017, there were 680 deaths of all ages recorded as probable suicides, down 7% on the previous year. Yet every death represents an unimaginable loss, and we should never regard suicide as an inevitable outcome. That's why an ambitious target of 20% reduction by 2022 places this issue at the top of this government's agenda. We can never be complacent regarding this fundamental public health issue. I particularly welcome the government's commitment to fund refresh mental health and suicide prevention training. This key theme emerged from the government's engagement with people affected by suicide. The mental health training should be central, compulsory component of our working culture, not to merely an afterthought. And I think it's significant the contributions of Bob Doris and Monica Lennon regarding our own staff uh, to that debate. And it's true not just for GPs and NHS staff, but, but for other frontline services, including pharmacists, job centre and benefits advisors, teachers, college and university staff and transport workers. Each should feel confident supporting people in distress. Thinking more closely about teachers and schools, See Me Scotland recently found that only 37% of young people would tell someone if they were finding it difficult to cope with their mental health. This is especially worrying as half of mental health problems in adulthood begin before the age of 14. Our teachers cannot and should not be expected to broach this challenge alone, which is why I was delighted to hear in last week's programme for government that ministers will invest over £60 million in additional school counselling services, creating around 350 councils in education across Scotland and ensuring that every secondary school has access to counselling services. Early intervention is crucial in mental health and suicide prevention, so I'm pleased that every young person in Scotland will have access to trained professionals who can identify and support those at risk. Also note the strategy's commitment to encouraging co a coordinated approach to public awareness campaigns, which maximise impact and break down stigma. In addition to this, I believe our media should take cognizance of its role in preventing suicide. Mental health experts advise that exposure to media coverage of a high profile suicide, especially one which fixates on the gratuitous or graphic detail of a person's death, can lead to more suicides, a phenomenon known as suicide contagion. Organisations such as Samaritans offer very useful guidance on reporting suicide. However, we saw the dangerous effects of journalists choosing to ignore this advice following the tragic death of the 55-year-old fashion designer Kate Spade and 28-year-old DJ Avicii earlier this year. Just hours after police announced they died, many news outlets reported graphic details of their suicides. While many studies have explored the dangers of such reporting, the evidence is not merely anecdotal. In the four months that followed Robin Williams taking his own life, the American suicide rate rose 10%. Center for Disease Control data showed that this rise was especially dramatic among middle-aged men who particularly identified with Mr. Williams. This is not just a question of ethical reporting or hypo hypotheticals, but of real lives lost. Suicide, like many other causes of death, is indirectly linked to a variety of factors which help us remain in good health, such as education, family, income, our communities and childhood experiences. It is therefore positive that the leadership group will identify specific action to protect population groups at greater risk of suicide. As each of us knows, and I mentioned earlier, suicide amongst young men is a particular concern in Scotland and the suicide rate for young men increased for the third consecutive year in 2017, a trend that must be reversed as a matter of urgency. We must also be mindful of where physical illness intersects with suicide. As convener of the Cross Party Group on Epilepsy, I've learned about how life with epilepsy can be made more difficult due to a lack of understanding and stigma associated with the condition. In addition, some areas of the brain responsible for seizures also affect mood and can lead to depression, and seizure medications may contribute to mood changes. Tragically, people with epilepsy are five times more likely to commit suicide than the general population, despite the excellent support offered by third sector organisations such as Quarriers and Epilepsy Scotland. I agree with the strategy's guiding sentiment that mental health must be in a par with physical health. However, we cannot ignore the fact that in many cases, one greatly influences the other. I hope this is something the new leadership group will examine and take forward. 
Of course, this strategy doesn't just exist in a vacuum of mental health policy, but rather must move forward in parallel with other complementary strategies. A national strategy to tackle social isolation and loneliness makes Scotland one of the first countries in the world to develop a strategy to address an issue which is intrinsically linked to suicide. Presiding officer, we ought to each and every family who's lost a loved one to suicide to do better, and I'm sure many of them will want to know that the Scottish Government is doing to ensure that lessons are learnt from their loss. Alongside the evidence of what helps prevent suicide, the lived experience of those affected by it gathered at the government's engagement events should provide the real basis for our actions. These families will know that preventable suicide in Scotland will not end with one strategy, but with years and years of concerted effort at a national and local level. We must continually ensure that we have the leadership and resources in place to meet our 2022 target, thereby saving around 140 lives per year. I hope that colleagues across the chamber will join me in committing to never letting suicide prevention fall off the political agenda. We can and we must do more. Thank you. Paul Morris Corey to be followed by James Dornan. Thank you, Deputy Prime Officer, for this opportunity to speak on this significant matter of suicide prevention, which affects many people across Scotland. I would like at this point to, pay, uh, to wish the uh, Minister well in her new role, particularly uh, with her experience in psychiatric nursing, which I know will become invaluable in her role. I thank the Scottish Government for publishing their suicide prevention plan, albeit a little later than expected. Uh, this week was marked worldwide by Suicide Prevention Day on Monday, highlighting the fact that suicide is a problem in nations around the world. Never has it been more crucial to raise awareness of an issue uh, that pervades all levels of society. It is clear that we cannot become complacent when it concerns suicide prevention, and indeed, Scotland still holds, unfortunately, the highest rate of suicide across the UK. Worryingly, 61% uh, of people in Scotland have been affected by this suicide rate, as has been already mentioned. Uh, these statistics show the urgency in needing to prevent people from taking their own life, with such an issue inevitably, inevitably affecting the wider family network. I believe that as part of the suicide prevention plan, there must be a focus on veterans, early service leaders and serving members of the armed forces to understand how suicide can affect these members in our community. And I'm pleased to hear the Minister's assurance today on this. And I trust that the armed forces and veterans sector will be represented strongly on the leadership board as well. Veterans can leave the armed forces with a lasting impact on their physical and mental health. Experiences within the armed forces can, for some, become too difficult to reconcile with their life upon return. For, for them, a transition back into civilian life can be too daunting and isolating without the mental health support and guidance they need. It is worrying to note that there are no official figures publicly available on the number of veteran suicide which occur each year. This makes it harder to understand the true scale of the problem and how best to combat it. One investigation conducted by Johnson Press has reportedly found 16 suicides were committed by veterans in the UK since January this year. Seven of these individuals are known to have fought in Afghanistan and Iraq. In order to have a robust and effective suicide prevention plan in place, one which involves support for our veterans, we must have official access to these statistics, especially, yes. Keith Brown. Can I thank uh, Maurice Corey for taking the intervention? And would you support the call that I've made a number of times for the MOD to insist that people on leaving the armed forces have to make an appointment with their first GP and that their health records follow them automatically? At least that way we'd have a better idea of where veterans are leaving when they leave the armed forces. Maurice Corey. I thank the member for his intervention and I fully support what you said. And only the other day I was speaking exactly the same words as you, sir. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> and I hope the Minister will address this issue about, uh, about the statistics. Uh, thankfully, there have been a number of studies examining uh, veteran suicides with the aim of greater transparency, and I hope these studies will, become, will both inform and impact our understanding of the issue, and I appreciate their work. For example, a study conducted by the University of Glasgow has found that those who have served in the armed forces do not uh, have a greater risk of suicide than the general public. Indeed, both veteran and non-veteran groups share the same peak age of male suicide, which is in the 40s. However, certain groups within the veteran community do face a slightly greater li likelihood of committing suicide. And of these groups, which includes older veterans and early service leavers, female veterans are especially at risk. 
More research must be done to chart this concerning link between female veterans and suicide. And I welcome a new study which explores the mental health of service women uh, as part of the armed forces women in close ground combat operations. I hope that this research will help aid suicide prevention support to be tailored to veterans who are in need of it. And we know that the toll of challenging military experiences can weigh heavy on the mental health of our veterans. This is not a new subject. Post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD as it's called, depression and anxiety are all factors that can, in some circumstances, identify a higher risk of suicide. As NHS Scotland has highlighted, employment insecurity, family breakdown, deprivation can also increase his risk. These are factors that are especially relevant to armed forces personnel when they leave the services. We must also note the service men and women are not standalone figures in our society. They are supported by families who in turn need our support. And remember that although the service men or women are wounded, it is the families who are injured. To help prevent this risk of suicide and its repercussions on loved ones, we must, the more must be done to promote the mental, health of wealth, the mental health of veterans, particularly of our current and former service men and women. Already there are shining examples of mental health charities that aim to support returning veterans. And recently I had the pleasure of visiting Horses for Forces in the Scottish Borders. And this charity provides coping strategies with horses to encourage veterans to re-engage with their loved ones and communities. Endeavours such as this one, including talking therapies mentioned already, can target feelings of abandonment and loneliness and help PTSD sufferers regain those, their confidence and self-esteem. The Combat Stress Charity also offers special care for veteran mental health, while the Scottish Association of Mental Health helps service men and women re-enter employment upon their return from duty. These charities offer more opportunities in which the risk of suicide amongst veterans can be identified and prevented before it's too late. And in conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, I wholly support the good work done by these groups and the care for the well-being of us of Scotland's veterans. And I hope that through this suicide prevention plan, there will be more opportunities to support their efforts. Thank you. The final contribution in the open debate is from James Dornan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And before I start, can I just, uh, like others, welcome Claire Hockey to a new position. I'm sure that the mental health services will, be, will benefit from Claire's experience. Presiding Officer, last week the government put mental health at the forefront of its agenda, and this debate is just another strand to the ongoing work which we need to undertake in order to tackle the atrocious condition of poor mental health, which can tragically lead to the death of so many men, women and young people across Scotland. But I'm sure, like me, uh, others will, be, will have welcomed the Scottish Government's early intervention strategy in mental health. Uh, and I'm sure it must have went some way towards what Brian Whittle was talking about earlier on, because I agree with a lot of what Brian says about physical and mental health going together, about early intervention. But you've got to recognise, surely, that the Scottish Government put that at the heart of the programme last, last week. And hopefully that's something that we'll be able to continue to work together on over the, the, the coming months and years. But not only do we have to tackle the ongoing illnesses which may lead to a person becoming a victim of suicide, but the many stigmas which surround this discussion of this issue and the care which the family so desperately need after losing a loved one. And I'll come back to this later. Uh, when Emma Harper was speaking earlier, one thing she forgot to mention is, and that's that she's a co-convener along with myself in the Mental Health Cross Party Group. And because of my interest in this issue, in my office we frequently had cause to discuss mental health issues. And sadly, at least two members of my staff have lost a friend or loved one within just the last few months to uh, suicide. And from chatting with those staff members and from personal experience, it's clear that the impact of suicide and attempted suicide is deep. And it's hurt ripples across the victim's friends and family circles for a long time, if not forever. So I'm pleased to see that when we're talking about this issue, there seems to be a consensus across the chamber when it comes to the care we must provide to those left behind. Like, I'm sure most of, of, if not all of the MSPs in this chamber, I've had constituents who have come to my office suffering from thoughts of, of suicide, from self-harm. And one of the, the, the most alarming was, uh, the parents were in such a state about their child that they came with the child who was about 16, who had been self-harming, who was threatening suicide, and they, they couldn't get her into hospital. Thankfully, with the intervention of, of the office staff, we managed to get her in that night, and the parents came back to, to speak to us later to say that they honestly believed 
that that intervention saved that young girl's life. And for me, that's one of the best results we've ever had as an MSP. Uh, we've had a number of others who have, have come to our, um, uh, our office or our surgeries who clearly have needed treatment. And like everybody else, we do our best to try and make sure that they get that treatment that is needed. And I've dealt with um, surviving partners and friends and, and parents of those who have uh, suffered from uh, a suicide in the family. Takes me on to Emily Druitt. Emily was a young constituent of mine, she, and she was a victim of suicide after an abusive relationship at university led to her mental health deteriorating at such a rapid pace that even her loving parents were unable to detect it. And during, during a period of sustained and premeditated domestic abuse, Emily tried to seek help at a place of study, but sadly her pleas somehow slipped through the net, and this young woman with the world at her feet felt she had no option other than to leave this world behind. And I spoke to her mother yesterday, uh, uh, who said to me, she says, uh, one of the things about the, the Druids, which is quite amazing, is that they have taken this personal tragedy and they've decided that it's not going to defeat them, that they're going to leave a legacy for Emily, and it is, has been working uh, to make sure that, no, that nobody else has to go through the horrors that they've done. So she's worked on, on a few suicide prevention things. One thing that she mentioned but is the lack of support given to Emily when the sign, and the signs not being detected, and also the lack of support to them as a family when their world crashed beneath them. Finding out her daughter had died and then left alone to cope. The police were great with us, but a support leaflet to services might have helped in those darkest moments after just something, she says. That's that tiny detail but would hopefully help others in the same situation. And I'm delighted to see in action points three and four that this has clearly been taken on board as well. And I hope the minister will reassure us that this will be dealt with uh, very, and taken very seriously. Emily's fa family struggle with this grief process every day, but th they've worked alongside Equally Safe campaign they've, uh, and they've continued to make sure that as I say earlier on, nothing will, like this will ever happen again. Now, I'm sure that every member taking part in this debate will have read many briefs and advice offered by the various mental health and third sector organisations and something which seems like a real issue, especially when it comes to males' suicide, is stigma. The removal of stigma in and around mental health and its treatment is the responsibility of every member of society. I heard just yesterday of a young woman who really needed mental health treatment and support and she said that she wasn't willing to go to her GP because her family thought it was a weakness. Well, there seems to be a lot of new support for those struggling with mental health and it's okay to, be not, to not be okay, hashtag, is taking the internet by storm. There's clearly still a lot of work to be done to ensure that that translates into real life, that families understand that talking is always better than staying silent because you don't want to hurt somebody's feelings. If you think there's a problem with your child or you think there's a problem with a friend, speak to them. Silence is not golden in this situation. The motion says every life matters and that is so true. No one on this planet can be replaced. I would just like to say that as parliamentarians, if we can set an example of a caring, accepted environment from the top levels down, then society can work together to remove stigma and to take care of those who need us most. Thank you. We move to the closing speakers. Alex Cole-Hamilton, uh, up to six minutes, please. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. It's been an excellent debate, and I, one of which, like with many other debates on similar themes, I find myself reflecting on that, that old quote, be good to each other, because the person standing in front of you may be fighting an internal battle you can't know anything about. And that is true. Uh, suicide is often hidden, or suicidal ideation is a hidden condition. It's unexpected, it's surprising. A lot of people had no idea that the person they loved who took their own life was even considering it. But our response to that cannot be silent. It needs to be loud, it needs to be bold, and it needs to be brave. And I think we have covered much of that, both in the action plan we debate this afternoon and in many of the great speeches we have heard. I, I'm grateful for the consensus. It's always one that we should have consensus about. And Annie Wells talked about the fact that there should be party, party unity on it. There is no ideology either in this chamber or beyond it which has a monopoly on concern for the tragedy and devastation that suicide can cause. 
Mary Fee, I think, was right to reference this back to early years. This starts in our response to child and adolescent mental health. And we have had this week the worst waiting times on record. And that is a, a warning cry for all of us. It shows just how important early intervention is, particularly in identifying and getting resource to those young people who suffer adverse childhood experiences. Because young people with unresolved trauma go on to become older people who have suicidal ideation. Alison Johnston also rightly stated that one suicide is too many, and I, I'm, I thank her for that because I hadn't covered the issue of the 20% target. Like Angela Constance, I, I find a, uh, a target here slightly jarring in the sense that you know if we've achieved a 20% uh, cut, then that's our work done. Of course it's not, but I do accept the target. We'll work towards it together, but I'm sure that the government will agree with me that very much represents a floor rather than a ceiling on our ambitions. Um, Claire Adamson, I think, uh, challenged my view on the delay, and, uh, and I think it's fair to say, though, that the first iteration of this strategy wasn't well received by its stakeholders. That said, she did make some really good points about partnership working, so I'll forgive her uh, for that challenge. Um, and and uh, going back to Angela Constance, I think drawing on her work as a social worker, I think when people speak to their own lived experience before elected politics, it's always enriching for the debate. And I found her phrase about her course of action in respect of the case she described as the least wrong decision was actually very elegant and apposite to this debate because this is such a complex issue that for some people, no course of action or intervention will be of help or will divert them from their final, final goal. Uh, but we have much, uh, again, to learn from each other in that regard. Uh, David Stewart, can I thank you and, and all the people who volunteer for Samaritans. It's always struck me as one of the most worthwhile and uh, profoundly humbling charities that, that are out there. I think that the peer-to-peer -peer support that you offer freely of yourself with appropriate training has saved countless lives. And again, I'm grateful to James Jopling, who I know as director of Samaritans in Scotland, was the fulcrum over which the success of this strategy has tipped because his work identifying the failures of the original draft working with the new minister has brought about a much more well-rounded and target-focused set of outcomes. I thank Emma Harper for referencing the, the work of my friend and colleague Jim Hume, former Lib Dem MSP. I should have mentioned Jim in my first speech. I hope he'll forgive me for not, but I, I, it is worth mentioning him now because his work, particularly in the agricultural community, working as, from his background in the NS, and as a, an a, a rural MSP um, has done amazing things in terms of bringing mental health to the fore and I was very grateful to spend some time with him at his stall in Ingleston at the Royal Highland Show this June and I think again this comes back to identifying um, those, at, those most at risk and the, the agricultural community are very much up there. Monica Lennon and James Dornan both reference similar cases to that of David Ramsey and I think what I was really struck by is the way that, as with David Ramsey's family, those families that they described um, have channeled their grief into campaigning vigor. And uh, I think it's fair to say that were it not for campaigning relatives who, who don't want other relatives to experience the same trauma that they have, um, we would not be as far down this agenda as we currently are. So I thank them once again for that. Maurice Corey made some uh, very compelling remarks about veterans, and I, I wasn't aware that we don't routinely capture um, suicides among the veteran community, something that needs to change. There is still detail that is required in this strategy, no, no question about it. And I hope very much to fill in part of that detail for my part in its delivery. Um, but the causes, this problem causes pressure. Self-harm and suicide cause pressure through all our public services. It drains on police time where people, police officers have a duty of care not to leave the side of somebody who is threatening to hurt themselves. I want to finish by recognizing that, um, well, Brian Whistle was the first to raise the vital issue of stigma as a theme that was, again, picked up by Bill Bowman. And it reminded me of a quote by the author, Sally Brampton. And she says, we don't kill ourselves. We are simply defeated by the long, hard struggle to stay alive. When somebody dies after a long illness, people are apt to say, he fought so hard. And they are inclined to think about a suicide that no fight was involved that somebody, somebody simply gave up, and that is quite wrong. 
presiding officer, we will all be judged in this chamber as to how we respond to the internal battle that so many people who are contemplating suicide today are facing. And I look forward to joining that fight with members from all parties in this chamber. Thank you. And a Sarwar, up to six minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Presiding Officer, can I say right from the outset, at a, at a time when so much of our political discourse, at least publicly, seems to be so bitter, angry and divided, the debate today has been uh, really refreshing, um, has been uh, unifying, and I think there have been fantastic contributions from right across the chamber. So uh, I won't be able to mention every speech that, that took place, but for every speaker, thank you uh, for their heartfelt um, contributions. I can also start by uh, welcoming the minister to her, her place. Uh, I, I wish her, genuinely wish her every success in her new role. Uh, and she comes to this uh, job with a vast experience, having been a mental health nurse uh, herself. Uh, and I'm sure the, uh, not only the government, not only NHS Scotland, but actually wider Scotland will benefit from that experience. Uh, and us, those of us on this benches uh, are looking forward to working with her in her new role. Presenting officer, in 2017, there were 680 suicides in Scotland. Um, and it's quite easy to think of that as 680 individual lives. But as was mentioned by so many speakers, a suicide doesn't just impact on that one individual. It leaves behind a heartbroken mother, father, sons, daughters, brothers, sisters, friends, uh, wider circles, work colleagues. And every single one of them is an absolute tragedy. Um, every single one of them is uh, unacceptable. Every single one of them is unavoidable, and every single one of them wasn't inevitable. Um, and that's why we have to recognise that the action that we take here in this chamber and the decisions we make as a country can actually help to save lives. Um, and I think this is an important starting point in that journey. So I want to commend uh, the government for the tone of the motion and the recognition that while some progress has been made over the past decade and a half, there is still far more uh, to do. I can also just, uh, for a moment, uh, join lots of other members, including uh, Annie Wells, Mary Fee, um, Dave Stewart, uh, Maurice Corey, Bob Doris, Kenny Gibson, James Dornan, and so many others, Monica Lennon, and so many others, uh, who did two things. One, thank all those that helped contribute to the Suicide Action Plan in terms of all the organisations, Samaritans in particular. Uh, all these people do a tremendous service in terms of lobbying uh, Parliament, lobbying parliamentarians, and helping us form the right policies uh, to go forward but also uh, to those that thanked those that work on the front line in our National Health Service. Um, those that work on our front line in our National Health Service who work with people who are uh, either suicidal or with families how, who have had a loved one who has committed suicide work in really, really difficult circumstances and that must impact on their own mental health and well-being and of those families as well. So I want to pay tribute to all those people that work in our health and social care sector who work directly with um, either people who are suicidal or those that are the um, victims, the families uh, of the victims of suicide, uh, as well as all the organisations. Um, it's been mentioned by Alison Johnson and by a, a number of others about the worrying trend in the last few years about young people, particularly those aged between 15 to 24, and that increase in each of those, uh, a rate in, in suicide for each of those in the last three years. Um, that's a worrying trend. Um, and it's also picked up by the study that we had by the University of Glasgow, which found that around one in nine young people aged between 18 to 34, had attempted suicide. One in nine young people, that's a stark, stark statistic. Um, a truly frightening statistic, and one I think should be a wake-up call to each and every single one of us. And that's why Mary Fee's amendment specifically recognised the importance of early intervention uh, and welcomes the Scottish Government's announcement on school counsellors. Uh, the Minister will be aware that this is a policy that we have been calling for for a, a number of years, so we welcome that announcement wholeheartedly and we look forward to see the outcomes of that in terms of the actual delivery of it, not just the commitment, so we can make these services a reality for so many young people uh, who need them. But we've also got to recognise that it's been done in the context of the poorest CAM statistics we have ever had uh, on record. Um, simply not good enough. Too many young people, three out of ten young people, who ask for help not getting their help uh, in time. That's something that we've got to markedly improve upon um, if we are to get a generational shift in mental health and a generational shift in how we tackle um, suicide. So we will continue to support the government, but also continue to ask robust questions of the government um, as well. And just a few questions as related to the Suicide Action Plan um, itself. Uh, there's a, a bit of lack of clarity around the role and authority of the National Suicide Prevention Leadership Group. 
Um, so perhaps the Minister in her closing statement can address the fact whether the group will have the authority to make funding decisions, uh, will it have the authority to set priority groups for uh, targeted activity, uh, will it have the authority to hold uh, the Minister herself and Government and indeed Parliament to account. Um, in terms of the funding, the three million is, is very welcome, uh, but it's one million per annum. So can the Cabinet Secretary clarify, or sorry, the Minister clarify uh, what this one million will be expected to cover? Will it cover the development of the new suicide prevention plan? Uh, will it cover the awareness campaigns that the suicide uh, prevention plan might want to lead upon? Um, will it be allocating fundings around um, how we match some of the aspirations that are in the plan in terms of some service delivery? Um, so some responses to that from the Minister would be very welcome. But as I, as I say uh, before, we, want to, we stand ready to work with um, the Minister to make the ambitions within the Suicide Action Plan um, a reality. Can I just close by saying something really quickly? And this was touched upon by Alec Cole Hamilton, um, as well as Monica Lennon, and also by James Dorn in terms of individual cases. Um, one individual case that was raised directly with me was by Gillian Murray, and that was the case of, of her uncle, David Ramsey. Uh, and we had, a, I think, a very robust debate, a very eye-opening debate in this parliament around a, a mental health services review uh, in Tayside, something that I'm glad we received cross-party support on, uh, and we now have that review. Uh, but my request would be for that review to please uh, have a Scotland-wide perspective, because I think there are lessons Scotland-wide about those that go to turn to services but are turned away from services and then end up in tragic circumstances. Uh, how we build genuine crisis mental health services so people who are in need of that desperate support can get it. How we use technology to overcome the staffing crisis, so the use of Skype uh, or FaceTime, and how we can red flag individuals who have been uh, repeated incidents that families have raised, uh, how they can be supported so we can avoid a tragedy taking place. So in closing, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, can I again welcome uh, the suicide prevention plan uh, thank all the contributions uh, that we've had in the Parliament today and say once again that we look forward to working closely with the Minister to take this forward. Miles Briggs, uh, no more than six minutes. Thank please. you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to close today's debate and also to, to welcome the Scottish Government's suicide strategy, uh, like many, many members have. And I agree with Anna Sauer. I think this has been one of the most useful, interesting debates um, I've certainly been involved since being elected to Parliament. I'd like to start by welcoming the new minister to her place. I enjoyed the time we spent together working on the Health and Sport Committee. I know her passion and real determination in this area, and I hope she'll really bring that uh, to her new role. I'm not sure how she'll be able to keep up her training now she's got this position, but I hope that she will in, in some way. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank those organisations like Samaritan Scotland, Sam H and Stonewall Scotland, which have provided useful briefings for today. Annie Wells set out effectively our, positioning in her, uh, our position in her opening speech. We recognise that the new final plan is a significant improvement on the draft plan and we welcome this. But the challenge now for ministers will be to implement the strategy and take forward urgent recommendations that will be made by the National Suicide Prevention Leadership Group to deliver the 20... 20% reduction by 2020. And as Annie Wells suggested, we need much more clarity from the Scottish Government around the resources that will be able to deliver in all aspects of the plan. And, what are the, and that's what our amendment seeks to do today. Delivering on this plan and ensuring it produces results is vital, as we've already heard. Scotland's suicide rate remains stubbornly higher than that south of the border. And as colleagues have stated across the chamber, we have particular challenges in terms of tackling and, prevention and preventing male suicides, especially in the 45 to 54 age group, which has seen an increase in suicide rates for the second consecutive year. And it remains a real stark reality that suicide is still the single biggest killer of men under 50 in the UK, as well as younger, younger people aged 25 to 34. As Alex Cole Hamilton and Claire Adamson mentioned, we need to find new ways of communicating with men and younger people who feel suicidal and ensuring that they know that there's support out there for them and that they can ask for help. And I'm really pleased that recent uh, hashtag It's OK to Talk campaigns and others have been shared widely on social media and endorsed by many leading, leading sports people and encourage everyone to promote this initiative. We also know that there's a lot of work to be done in preventing suicide in our economically disadvantaged communities, with the suicide rate more than two and a half times higher among the most deprived tenth of the population compared to the least deprived. I think Bob 
Bob, Dor Bob Doris was the one who actually um, highlighted the Samaritans' work on this and the fact that they've continuously emphasized the need for suicide prevention plans to be locally focused and tailored in the specific needs of diverse communities. I very much uh, support this and endorse it and hope that the, the new leadership group will give this uh, local programs a strong focus and backing. The importance of public awareness of suicide is especially important and services are very available locally to help those at risk um, has been raised a number of times during the debate. It's a real concern that polling by Samaritans has indicated that early in the year actually that the four in ten people in Scotland said that they do, would not know who to turn to, to if they were in a, a point of crisis and supporting someone in crisis. I look forward uh, to seeing innovative new approaches here uh, that can build on the work which has already been done in awareness campaigns to date. The number of people talked um, openly about the importance of early intervention, and I concur with this and agree with the points that Alison Johnson made with regards to self-harm. I think that's something which is very important. Ensuring that we have effective, accessible mental health services that are available when people need them can help, I believe, uh, make a real difference. And, uh, and that's something which I think also was important was the point Emma Harper made uh, with regards to rural proofing suicide policy. And I think that's something I hope will be taken forward. Mental health and suicide prevention training has been raised on a num by a number of members this afternoon, and it's rightly key part uh, of the Early Life Matters programme. Sam H's briefing makes an important point with regards to re the refresh of suicide awareness training and retaining some of the key points uh, which we've already put forward in practices, for example, in ASSIST, and for key groups like GPs. And I wanted to also endorse what Anna Sarwar said with regards to trauma-trained public services. I think that could make a huge difference if we look to roll that out. And I want to take this opportunity to thank all those in my region and specifically to Dave uh, Stewart here in our parliament um, for the volunteering that they undertake with Samaritans and indeed with other mental health charities. They make a huge contribution each and every day and genuinely help to save lives. And we should all recognize uh, and welcome and thank them for the difference they make. I also, I, I know he probably will not welcome the fact that he's been praised by a Tory MSP, but I want to pay tribute uh, to James Dornan's contribution. I think it was very considered and, and important for today's debate as well. And finally, I wanted to mention um, for an incident which I think all of us were aware of uh, this summer, and that was the tragic death in May of the frightened rabbit singer Scott Hutchison. Scott's tragic death from suicide attra attracted significant and high profile attention of the issue. And I, I note the points which have been made with regard to that. But I think this was a genuine and I believe national outpouring of not only sympathy for his family and friends, but also a national understanding that we need to work to address the issue of men in Scotland taking their lives by completing suicide. I'd like to pay tribute to his family and friends who have spoken about Scott's battle with depression uh, in recent weeks. Scott talked openly about his mental health problems and Scott's family have, have spoken about what a wonderful person he was indeed. But they also said this statement, which I think I found very compelling. It was, depression is a horrendous illness that does not give you any alert or indication as to when it will take hold. I think that's a very important point for this debate to consider in the new strategy to make sure that our emergency port support and help actually put, puts that at its heart. All of us in this chamber will agree that every single suicide is indeed a tragedy for the individual involved, for their families, friends and society more widely. If we get the delivery of this plan right, then I believe we can make progress in the years ahead and reduce suicide rates. Scottish Conservatives will continue to work constructively with ministers and stakeholders to help achieve this. Every single life really does matter. I call on the Cabinet Secretary, Jean Freeman, to close the debate. Eight minutes will take us to decision time. <clears throat> Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, can I start by trying to answer um, the questions that uh, Anna Sauer raised, because they were raised by others um, during the debate. And can I also say, uh, before I do that, that I will not necessarily answer all the questions that people raised. That's partly because I don't write fast enough and partly because there are other things I need to say. But um, if uh, members want to pass those questions to us, then we will most certainly answer them. Uh, and all you need to do is give us a bit of paper. You don't need to go through the whole shebang. On the point that uh, Mr. Sawar made, can I, can I make it clear that the £3 million that is talked about is additional 
to the £2 million pounds that is already allocated to support services. And the role of the leadership group is to provide recommendations on priorities and the use of resources, uh, including where the leadership group believes that additional resources are needed over and above what I have mentioned and what is committed in programme for government to the minister and to COSLA. And it will be indeed the minister who is accountable, uh, along with me, to this parliament for how well we progress. Let me start properly then, presiding officer, by thanking colleagues for their contributions this, during the debate and for the positive ideas and suggestions uh, that they have brought forward. I think the debate itself, but most importantly, the tone and the contributions clearly show the importance that this parliament places on preventing suicide. But it also challenges us all of us to think very hard about something we find difficult to talk about and difficult to understand. It is particularly important, I think, that we recognise the impact on the families who have been affected by the suicide of a loved one, because that brings home the impact that every single death has. And I'm pleased that that is recognised in the action plan and that their uh, experiences will be important. Like others, I want to thank the many organisations and individuals who have taken time to contribute to the, plan, the development of the plan and, with Mr Sarwar and others, also thank uh, all of those who work in our health and care services and in our third sector organisations, working directly with people uh, who are experiencing mental distress and contemplating suicide. We should, I think, presiding officer, recognise a degree of success in the work so far, the work of those individuals amongst others, to reduce suicide in Scotland over the past 11 years, a reduction of 20%. I make that point not to suggest for one minute that there is not more that we have to do, but to give that as the foundation on which we should work. Mary Fee is absolutely correct to say that what we're looking for is a radical uh, change in our attitude and in the services that we uh, construct and deliver so that we recognise the equal importance of mental health with physical health. And she's also uh, correct that it is preventable in so many ways by early intervention. And I'm particularly pleased that colleagues have recognised the importance that we have placed in that in the programme for government uh, announcements last week. Mary Fee is also right that in the overall work on mental health, of which the suicide uh, prevention plan is a critical element, uh, features uh, so significantly in the programme for government. I turn to Alec Cole Hamilton. Alec was one of the first, I think, to make the point about the importance of working uh, with men in particular. It is over the five-year rolling statistics, as colleagues will know, the single group that has shown an increase in the level of suicides. And yes, it is right that men are talking more about feelings now than perhaps they were in the past, but not yet enough. And not yet enough to their friends and to their family and with their support seeking the help that is there uh, and that in this plan we intend to ensure is there as part of the overall package on mental health services. And in Programme for Government, we recognise that work needs to be done to provide the right intervention and support at the right time. It is important, I think, that we have identified that that is a group that needs particular targeting and support and work, because by reviewing suicides, all, the, all of that is the key to getting exactly that right support in the right place at the right time. The Minister was absolutely correct to say that this is a cross government exercise, it, but it's also cross society. And I'm grateful to colleagues for mentioning the many other organisations that are involved in this work, from football clubs to young farmers, schools, students, community groups, private and public sector. Brian Whittle is correct to point to the importance of physical activity. And when the First Minister and I were at Leith Academy last week, talking with those young people about mental health and their strategies for coping for those occasions when they felt down or, or distress, physical exercise featured strongly. And one young man in particular sticks in my head when, we, when asked why, he said, it makes me feel better. The, the challenge to us 
is to maintain that support for physical activity in our young people as they move through their 20s, their 30s and on uh, into later life, and particularly uh, young women. I, I should mention in passing, therefore, that things like the women's football team reaching the World Cup matters because these are all role models and pointers uh, to what can be achieved. And I, I would say that we recognise that, as Kenny Gibson says, this uh, suicide action plan does not sit in isolation. It sits alongside uh, the isolation and loneliness strategy that will be shortly published. It sits alongside the diet and healthy weight strategy that we're uh, working on just now on Active Scotland and so on. Can I also just say finally, uh, presiding officer, before I conclude, that I'm particularly grateful to Angela Constance for her contribution and the honesty that she demonstrated when she talked about making the least wrong decision. It is a challenge for all of us in our individual roles in this parliament uh, when we confront situations where that is where we are going to make the least wrong decision. Learning from reviews of those su suicides that do happen will help us uh, make better decisions about what we need to do. Let me finally say that I hope this debate, the uh, suicide action plan that we are discussing and has been published, the work of the leadership group that we've set in train, the leadership of Rose Fitzpatrick, all of that will signal to this parliament just how seriously this government takes this work, how determined we are to work across this chamber to ensure that suicide absolutely is preventable in our country, because in Scotland, every life does matter. Thank you very much. And that concludes our debate on Suicide Prevention Action Plan. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 13863 in the name of Graham Day on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a business programme and I would remind members that Parliament has agreed to vary the rule on business motions so that any member may now speak in the motion with uh, my discretion. I call on Graham Day to move the motion on behalf of the Bureau. Uh, move, presiding officer. Thank you. And no one wishes to speak against the motion. The question therefore is that motion 13863 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. We turn now to consideration of four parliamentary Bureau motions, could I ask Graeme Day on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau to move motions 13864 on establishment of a private bill committee, 13865 on approval of an SSI, 13867 on membership of the Congress of Local and Regional Authorities and 13880 on subcommittee membership. Uh, move, President Officer. Thank you very much. And we'll take these questions at decision time to which we now turn. The first question is that Amendment 13847.1 in the name of Annie Wells which seeks to amend motion 13847 in the name of Claire Hockey on Suicide Prevention Action Plan, Every Life Matters, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next question is that amendment 13847.3 in the name of Mary Fee, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Claire Hockey, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next question that that motion is that amendment 13847.2 in the name of Alex Cole Hamilton, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Claire Hockey be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And the next question is that motion 13847 in the name of Claire Hockey as amended on Suicide Prevention Action Plan be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I propose to put a single question on the four parliamentary bureau motions. Does anyone object? No one does. That's good. Uh, the question is that motions 13864, 13865, 13867 and 13880 in the name of Graham Day on behalf of the Bureau be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. That concludes decision time. We turn now to members' business in the name of Patrick Harvey on social enterprises working to tackle child poverty, but we'll take a few moments for members and the ministers to change seats.